here today. Just be thankful Brother Wayne didn't have you do Tony Chestnut this morning, because I thought that's what he was going to do, and uh, you know, we could do it. We proved it this week that we can do it, and so, uh, but anyway, he was easy on you with the peace, although on that third, you're supposed to do a fourth verse, I have peace, love, and joy like a river, and then it gets real crazy, because he, he, old people can't remember, I mean, um, <clears throat> I mean, um, senior, more senior people have difficulty with those motions. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 12 this morning, and uh, we're going to uh, have a good time here in Sunday school. This is going to be more of a review. Uh, we've been going through our spiritual gifts in here on Sunday, in Sunday school for, I don't know, uh, however many gifts there are, that many weeks. And so it's been a good while. And so this morning, I just want to put it all in on one page. And so hopefully you've got some notes uh, this morning. I think my son was handing those out. And your notes are the same as my notes. There's no blanks this morning. And the, the reason for that is now you have this little mini booklet you can take home and it tells you about all the gifts and, uh, and, and, and everything that we've kind of gone through. But we'll start in Romans 12 here. And then we're, what we're going to do this morning, it's actually going to be a different day. Let me just tell you, it's going to be a little bit different day. Two reasons. Number one, here in Sunday school, we have a test, all right? I got a test for you after it's all over, okay? So we're going to do our review. And then we're going to, this is what you do in school, right? You do a review, and then you have to take the test. Now, this isn't actually a test, it's an inventory, okay? So you can't fail, but when we started spiritual gifts, I gave you a, a spiritual gifts test or spiritual gifts inventory, a different one, and you took that, and so you, you may have had an idea of what your spiritual gift was based upon that, um, but these are, just, um, these are just tools to use to, to help us to zoom in on what maybe our spiritual gifts are. So it's good to take a couple different ones. And so now that we've gone through all of the gifts, uh, I want you to, to take another one here and just see if it, if it now after having the explanation, going through the, the inventory, if you're um, still arriving at your same gift or maybe uh, maybe help you to, to sort that out. So anyway, we're going to go through the review and then we'll have a test. And then we got to get all that done in time where we can go have choir practice after this. So that's one way that it'll be a different day. Another is in the morning service, and I'll, I'll explain this in the morning, but uh, uh, this happens occasionally. I went to bed with a message that I had prepared and preached and was ready for, and I woke up with a different one. And so um, we're going to be, uh, it's going to be a little bit different today. And so anyway, let's go Romans chapter 12. Let's look at our spiritual gifts. <clears throat> Glad that you're here. I'm excited for the day. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may uh, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For, we, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would please help us today um, just to get, Lord, the messages that uh, you have for us. Lord, I believe very strongly today that you have something you want to say. And I pray that you would help us in Sunday school time here to, uh, as we review these gifts. Um, Lord, and we try to identify what, what it is that you've gifted us to do. Uh, help us not only to learn of our gift, but Lord, then to use it uh, as the scripture tells us we need to do here. And so, Lord, I pray you bless in our, our Sunday school time. Lord, bless in the uh, afternoon, uh, in, in the morning service and afternoon as well. And, and Father, please be with the children downstairs and in uh, Sunday school and junior church and the, the teens. And Lord, everything that's going on here uh, in your church today, would you please bless it? And uh, Lord, we, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to grab a drink here. Um, we went camping a couple days, and uh, those trees out there were such that, and I don't really have allergy problems, 
you guys want to know all about this, don't you? Yeah, I don't have allergy problems. Those trees out there, I, I, they're just raining yellow pollen, I think is what it is. And so we were, my, you know, you'd park somewhere, you'd come back, my truck's black, it would be yellow when we got back. And one time we were walking and Harper had a fishing pole and she accidentally hit a branch. And I mean, it just pff, dusted. And so all, I, I usually don't have allergy problems, but I think I do now because of all that. So I think we'll be okay though. All right. So we've been looking at these spiritual gifts for several weeks. I just want to review Romans 12, and I know we've read it, oh, I don't know, 15 times now uh, that we've been here. But notice in verse 1 and 2, the, the whole context of this chapter and passage is that we would be serving God. Notice verse 1, that, that he, he's beseeching them. Beseech just means, it means to beg. It means to, to plead or to ask with heart. And so he's, he's begging them, he's asking them by the mercies of God, that they present their bodies a living sacrifice. That would be that we would give ourselves to serve the Lord, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your, and notice the word here, reasonable service. I say this a lot, but it is reasonable that we would serve God. It's reasonable that we would give our life for him. He gave his life for us, amen? So it would be reasonable then that we would give our lives in service to him, and, and we can never repay the Lord. We can never give back enough. So that that it's very reasonable that we do that. But if we're going to serve God, we can't serve him the way that he found us, right? When Jesus saved us, he, he changed us eternally. For one, he uh, gave us his Holy Spirit and he put us in his family and he redeemed us from our sins. So he changed us immediately. But then the Lord continues to change us and, and, and make us more like him so that we can serve. So notice verse two. If we're going to serve God in, in, in a reasonable way, uh, acceptable to God, like verse 1 says, then, we, then verse 2 has to happen where we're not conformed to the world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind or through the renewing of our mind. So God has to transform us so that we can serve him. And, and the basic premise for this is not something that uh, we're unfamiliar with. You know, if you start a new job somewhere, there's a training period, isn't there? I mean, wherever you go, you start a new job. They got to kind of show you. It doesn't really matter how simple the job is or complex. Um, they're going to have to show you how uh, to do that job and train you for that. And there's certain jobs you go to school and you learn. And, and I mean, if you're going to be a brain surgeon, I, I would hope that there's years and years of, of training before you ever cut into someone's skull, right? Um, even if you've ever had your blood drawn, aren't you thankful that, that the, the, what are those people called that poke, go around poking people? Phlebotomists. Aren't you glad that they practiced on some oranges before they practiced on you? And, and some of them probably need to practice a little more on some oranges. But anyway, I'm just telling you this, um, th there's a training period. There's a, well, you, you could call it like there's some personal growth that has to happen. And, and um, I, I know some that, you know, I've had a, a, just recently, I was uh, getting a little health check. It was about a year and a half ago, and they wanted to draw blood and do different things. And, and whoever did mine, I mean, it was just like they did it a thousand times a day. It was no big deal. I never even felt anything. And I thought, man, this person is good at that. Well, well how did they get good at that? Well, training, right? Growth. So this is the basic premise or principle that we understand. No matter what we do, we have to grow into doing that. And, and, and the more we practice and, and train at something, hopefully the better than we get. Well, it's not exactly the same as that, but that's the premise. But, but here's what happens in the spiritual realm. As, as we, when we get saved, we get saved. We're a mess. Right, the day you get saved, you're a mess. you're a complete mess. And you say, well, what do you mean? Well, you were you were in the devil's family one second before you got saved, and then you get saved, you're in God's family. Well, all this changed is Christ has forgiven you. All this changes, He's given you a, the new creation, the new man, and so a, a lot has changed. But you're still a mess. And so what the Bible teaches over and over and over is this thing called sanctification, and it it's not our salvation, it's not how we go to heaven, but God wants us to be transformed. Uh, into his image. He wants us to be more and more like him. And, and this process continues throughout our whole life. And so in verse two, there's a transformation that takes place through the renewing of our mind. And, and we saw, we, we went and did the study on this, that, that it's the work of the Holy Spirit and the word of God that helps to transform and change us day to day. Uh, one passage says from glory to glory into his image. And so uh, that's, that's what's got to happen if we're going to serve him. So the context is service, and the context is, is, um, is, is growing to a place 
in our life where we can then serve God, all right? Then he starts to talk about the, the grace given to every man, spiritual gifts that are given. And he, and he identifies this under the heading of the local church. We have many members in one body, right? That's just your, your physical body. You have many members in one body. All those members have not the same office, right? Uh, this morning, I, I drank coffee, as is my custom and addiction. Uh, I drank coffee this morning. And, and listen, I did not grab the coffee cup with my foot and go and put it on the thing. That'd be pretty impressive, wouldn't it? Um, I, I can't do that. You know what I used? I used my right hand. I couldn't even do it with my left hand. Uh, I'll tell you this. The other day, I made a cup of coffee, and I, I put the cup under there. I have my little, I have a Yeti cup with a lid on it. Put it right under the coffee maker, pushed go, walked away. Made the whole cup right on top of the lid. Have y'all ever done that? Yeah, so that was a, you know, it, it didn't make me mad I had to clean it up. It was a waste of good coffee is what the real problem was. But anyway, I had to reset it. But anyway, so, so I'm just telling, I got to use my right hand and, and apparently most of my brain to make coffee because those, those are the members of my body. That's what they do. Other members of our body do other things like our, our feet help us to walk. Our ears help us to hear. Our eyes help us to see. Um, and, he's, and he's saying just like that, just, just like you have a body with many members, the church is a body with many members. And those members don't all have the same office. There, there's many different things that, that occur in the spiritual realm. And God has placed the church. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. It is, the, uh, it is ground zero in the battle, uh, the spiritual battle of this world. I'm telling you, the church is ground zero. Uh, a lot of people um, these days are, are walking away from the church and they're kind of doing their own thing. We're just going to go and we're going we're gonna to just be Christians on our own. Well, well you're not going to be a Christian and do that. A Christian is a follower of Christ and Christ established his church. And so church is very important. Why? Because the, it, it's, a, it's the organism, uh, the body that God has placed to be the spiritual ground, the, 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 the ground zero where the truth is. And so he's saying he's put this church together in order that we might reach the masses, reach the people with the gospel and train people. We've read Ephesians 4 and we're memorizing Ephesians 4 in Sunday morning, on Sunday mornings. And so uh, we understand that he's put the church here for the perfecting of the saints, right? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The church is here so that we can come together. We can, this, this ch verse number two transformation thing, is helped by the church as we hear the word of God preached, as we uh, minister together and serve together, we grow and, and saints are edified, work of the ministry is done, and, and, and eventually that, that then we leave this building, we leave this assembly, we go out into the world and we make a difference. And so he's organized the church for that purpose. And, and, and church is, is extremely important. I would say uh, if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you have to be involved in the local church. I don't see any other biblical way around it. In fact, all the people that I've ever talked to that decided to do it their own way, after a couple of years, they're not doing anything. And you say, why aren't they doing anything? Because God didn't design it to be a singular, solo, I'm going to go do my own thing. No, he, he uh, uh, well, Hebrews 10, 25 uh, talks very strongly about neglecting the assembling of the church. In fact, you read down a couple of verses, it speaks about trampling underfoot the, the Son of God. Um, and so he, he thinks church is very important. Um, God, uh, the Bible says in the book of Acts, God shed his own blood for the church, all right? So this is the place, uh, this is the assembling, I know it's not the building, but the assembling where we come, this is the body, and the body has all these different members, different gifts, and, and you might think, well, I don't know, all these members, we got some weirdos around here, right? We got some, we got some different people. Um, that's rude, y'all shouldn't think like that, by the way, um, but no, it, it is that we're different. Not everyone across the aisle is going to be the same as you or have the same gifts. Um, God designed it that way. And, and sometimes the gifts uh, rub each other the wrong way, perhaps, because they're so opposite. Um, but all of them are needed because not every member has the same office. Verse 4, not every member have the same office or the same function. We learn in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 that um, there, there's a, a diversity of, of gifts, but it's the same Lord, right? There's a diversity of administrations or different administrations or jobs, but it's the same God all in all that works through. 
So these, this is why God's organized it this way, because not, not, no, not any one of us um, possesses all of the spiritual gifts. Not any one of us is able to do the job of the church by ourselves. Did you know that? The pastor of the church is not even able to do the job of the church by himself. It's, it's not designed that way. We're not gifted that way. And so uh, he's put us all together so that we could do the job of the church together. We could function together as a body. So let me just pause and, and say this. When you're, um, you know, I saw a post the other day that said something like, whenever you hit age whatever, the check engine light's going to come on, right, in your, in your body. And I guess that's probably true. At some point in life, the check engine light's going to come on. There's going to be some part of your body that no matter, no matter how hard you try, it's just not going to cooperate. And some of you know that because you're walking around with a metal knee, maybe, uh, or a different hip, or maybe a, some other transplant, or, or maybe you got like half your teeth or, uh, you know, false teeth or something like that because some member of your body decided, I'm done, I'm out, oh, move on, move on. I just, I, I just hope at the rapture, I just, at, when the rapture happens, if we're in church, I'm going to look down real quick just to see all the parts laying in the church, all the hips and knees and all that. I just, want, I just want to real quick, I mean, it's going to be like twinkling of an eye, but I'm just going to boom and just look and make sure we're leaving behind all those knees and stuff. Right, Brother Steve? Okay, he's got two of them to leave behind. So when a part of your body is not functioning right, yes, sir. I'm going to let God answer that when you get to heaven. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think you get a new body, so it probably doesn't matter. But anyway, yeah, I'll let God answer that. Good question, though. All right. Any other questions like that? Okay. <laughs> oh, man, what was I doing? Oh, yeah, teaching. That's right. Um, you know, no, we, when a member of the body, when something in your body doesn't work right, it, it, it limits your function, right? It, it limits your ability to move. and It, it limits your ability to, to, you know, do your job maybe or, or um, you know, uh, if you have like, major back problems, it, it hinders your ability to do a lot of things. And so that's the idea, and that's what I believe that uh, Paul is trying to teach when he's writing Romans is that it's imperative that all the members of the church be uh, knowing their gifts, exercising their gifts, and following the 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 Spirit's leading and being conformed to His image and, 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 and in a Christ-like way, utilizing the gifts. Because, listen, if, if, there's, if there's members of the church who aren't exercising their gifts for the Lord, the church is hurting, okay? It's, it, they're, they're, we're not functioning as we should. We're not being as effective as we could be. There, there's things going undone or, or we're not going as far as we could. And, and that's the whole point of, of Romans chapter number 12. Now, I spent all that time on introduction, so now we got to get going here. You can read 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 16 on your own, uh, in, in your own time, maybe later. That's where Paul is telling Timothy, neglect not the gift that is in thee. That's what he tells him, neglect not the gift that is in thee. Uh, in other words, Tim, he's telling Timothy, Timothy's a very young preacher, probably like late teens, early 20s, very, very young, and he's going to go and he's going to be a pastor of, of these people, and he's like, don't let anyone, let not... Okay, I've got it memorized, but sometimes the, the wires get crossed. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example unto the believers. Yeah, so let, let, don't let anyone, Timothy, despise your youth. And in the, in the next verse, neglect not the gift that's in thee. You're not doing it of your own power. It doesn't matter what your age is. You have been gifted by God and chosen by God. So you go and you serve using your gifts. All right, so why do we need all these gifts? I just thought this was neat to point out. Turn to 1 Peter 1 Peter chapter 1, and I just wanted, I just wanted to show you this, and then we're going to roll through the gifts real quick, because I do, I kind of want you to have time to mess with your uh, spiritual gifts test while we're here, and um, so let's look at uh, 1 Peter 1, and I just put on your notes, manifold grace for manifold temptations. Look at 1 Peter 1, because Paul does call in, in several places, these gifts, grace. He says the grace bestowed upon me or the, the measure, according to the measure of grace. And so uh, not that every time you see the word grace that it's referring to spiritual gifts, um, but it is a grace given to us. All right, 1 Peter 1, verse 6. 
wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, if you're uh, good at working on cars, you probably know what a manifold is, right? Manifold, it just takes uh, exhaust gas and spreads it out uh, and, and then directs it to the exhaust system. Um, but a manifold, is the idea is that at one end, it's singular. At the other end, it's uh, got multiple outputs. And I know that's not exactly how a car manifold works, but that's the idea is that it's almost like there's, there's differing, diverse, many types of temptation. That's what he, he's saying. Look, you're, you're going to go and, and it says rejoice, even though you're in heaviness right now, you're in a season of, of many temptations. He's just telling us in this life, there's all sorts of different trials, temptations, troubles, challenges. And isn't that the truth? I mean, you kind of get through one challenge. You think, man, that was probably the hardest thing you've ever done. And then you look up and here comes the next challenge. And it's different. Uh, I tell my wife all the time, I, we'll, we'll kind of laugh and I'll just say, I've never seen this one before, right? Never seen this one. Well, this is a new one here. We're going to learn a new thing here. We're going to go through this challenge now. Um, that's manifold temptation. But, but look, look over in 1 Peter chapter 4, if you haven't already cheated and look over there. 1 Peter chapter 4 and look at verse 10. And notice, notice the context here. Okay, it says, As every man hath received the what? The gift. Even so, what? Minister, which means to serve or to, to, to help, the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So in this verse, it says, Every man, okay, every man, so uh, when we're in Bible school, when we're talking about we're all sinners, I had them all raise their hand. If all means you, let's raise our hand. So that's all of us, right? Every man means all of us. Every man. So if you've been saved, you have received the gift. It, it, there's, I've heard people say, I've had people, I'm just not gifted. Uh, the Lord just didn't give me. Oh, he did. If you don't think he did, then you're either in denial of it or ignorant of it. Uh, you just don't know about it is what I mean. No, if you're saved, he's gifted you. As God has gifted every man, or as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. What he's saying is this, you minister the way you've been gifted. That's what he's saying. If you're gifted with the gift of exhortation, then exhort. If you're gifted with the gift of the teacher, then teach. If you're gifted with the gift of the prophet, then preach. If, if you're gifted with the, the gift of, of helps, then, then, then help. If you're gifted with the gift of mercy, then go, go, go uh, comfort those who are in need of mercy. But he's saying, as you've been gifted, use the gift. As you've been gifted, that's how you want to serve. Now, why is it so important that we serve as we're gifted? Well, did you notice the rest of the verse? This is how many times God uh, uh, helps us through those manifold temptations, because notice what it says, as good stewards of the what? Manifold grace. So I'm telling you, for every trial of life, there's grace. For I mean, yeah, there's manifold. You say, well, I don't know what I'm going through. You don't know about the grace of God that's available for that trial, right? It, 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 no matter what your trial is, and it's manifold. Maybe it's different. Maybe it's, it's, it's harder than the last thing you went through, or maybe it's just something you haven't seen before. God has grace for it. Okay, so there's manifold temptations, there's manifold grace available, but how is that grace received, at least in the context of this verse? It's when someone is using their spiritual gift. They're, they're serving as they have been gifted. And I'll tell you this, if you, uh, if you serve uh, in an area that you're not gifted in, you're probably going to be very frustrated. Um, you know, if, if, you're not, uh, if you're not a teacher... And, and, and the pastor is like, hey, you need to teach this class or whatever. Uh, and and, and I've, I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen before in churches where maybe there's just a need for a teacher. And so it's like, hey, you're breathing. You want to teach this class? <laughs> you know, I know that sound was that rude. But no, it's like the, the preacher's like, hey, this guy is alive. We'll put him in there as a teacher. Right. And so you just kind of fill the gap. You fill the hole and and then this guy, he's trying to teach, but he's not gifted of the Lord to teach. He's going to be very frustrated. Um, it, it's not, it's not going to go well. It, it, it would be better, right, to pray and wait and, and find someone who is a teacher and then, and then put them in that position. And sometimes people have to teach 
before they learn. You know, they get in there and they go, I, I, thought, I thought I wanted to do this. This isn't me. You know, that, that kind of thing can happen too. I'm just saying, if we serve where our gift is, we'll find fulfillment because that's how God has created us and designed us to work. And so that's what's why it's so important to find our gift. Not only that, not only will you be fulfilled if you serve with your gift, um, but, but second of all, you'll help to um, bring grace to those that are needing grace. Okay, The, the, the manifold grace, uh, you'll be that, a conduit of that, that you can help bring that grace to that person who needs it. Because God's given all these gifts, as it says in 1 Corinthians 12, for us to profit with all. And that just means we're going to be helped by the gifts. If we're all serving with our gifts, we will be helped. All right, so let's look at the gifts real quick together. And uh, I spent a whole week preaching through each one, so this, this is meant to be quick um, going through this. But the spiritual gifts are um, uh, listed here. Now, I, I put a little, couple of little blurbs, all right? These little um, parentheses that are um, in italics here. Notice what it says. Keep in mind we're only talking about the practical gifts as the miraculous gifts such as tongues and miracles have ceased. We discussed that in lesson one. All right, so you may have to go back to lesson one if you want to look at those uh, spiritual or mira sorry, miraculous gifts. We're talking about the practical gifts. Now, we're going to go through them, and then I'm going to tell you a little caveat about these gifts as well. But remember, we talked about the prophet, the gift of the prophet. The gift of the prophet is the one that um, is, is just very much concerned about God's truth and error. I mean, that's, what it, that's all he really cares about. Um, everything is very black or white. Everything is very right or wrong. There's very little grace with the prophet. There's very little wiggle room in God's commands with the prophet. It's, it's just right or wrong. And so, uh, you know, you have the prophets in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord, and then they're bringing, that, bringing down fire and brimstone, right? And it's either turn or burn that, for the prophet. I mean, I, I know that's a kind of a harsh saying, but for the prophet, that's what it is. It's like, no, you, you get your life right, and then, and then things will change. Uh, the prophet's very concerned with truth and has a, uh, as, as Jeremiah said, he, he tried to remain quiet, right? He, he tried to hold it in, but the, the word of God was like a fire in his bones, okay? That's part of being the prophet is that uh, you, you just can't be quiet. You're ate up with it, and you, you need a place. You need somewhere that you can go and, and you can preach and proclaim. And so most prophets, people gift with a prophet, uh, become uh, preachers. Of course, we, we could see many examples of this in the Bible, but the one I put here in your notes is John the Baptist. John the Baptist lost his head for being a prophet. If you remember Mark chapter number 6 and uh, verse 16 through 18, he called out a, a marriage that shouldn't have been a marriage, and he lost his head because of it. Mo everyone else knew it shouldn't have been a marriage too, by the way, and weren't saying anything. And he went and he preached, and, and uh, next thing you know, they're bringing his head in on a platter. He was a prophet. The second gift we talked about was the gift of knowledge. Uh, the gift of knowledge, actually, these aren't in order of the way we, uh, we, we preach them. It's just the second one on your page. But the gift of knowledge is someone who is able to study God's Word and grasp the meaning. Uh, being able to get into God's Word, and it seems like they just get the answers quicker, or they're able to find the information faster. And, and so these are the people that they compile a lot of outlines and notes and commentaries and and many times those gifted with the gift of teaching will also have the gift of knowledge um, because knowledge doesn't really do us a whole lot of good if we don't share that knowledge. But there are people who just love studying the Bible. They just love, you could lock them in a room with their Bible and, 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 and uh, throw them some food every now and then. They'd be perfectly fine. They'd be happy. There's people like that. They're gifted with the gift of knowledge. Very helpful in the church um, because we are supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth. And so when someone has a question about someone's kidney, um, they, they, they might have that answer, right? Uh, the gift of knowledge. The thirdly is the gift of wisdom. The gift of wisdom, oh, gift of knowledge, uh, I put the church at Berea because the church at Berea heard the preaching. That's all good. But then they went home and they studied the word to make sure those things were so. You know, they went back and they said, okay, let's see, what did he say? And they looked in the Bible to make sure that that was so. So they're, they're a good example of that. Then we have the gift of wisdom. The gift of wisdom, Solomon is our example here. The gift of wisdom is, is somewhat like the gift of knowledge, but it's more or less putting that knowledge into action. Um, I, I knew a lady that, um, you know, she, she knew that her car ran on gasoline. She knew that. Uh, she was aware of that. But she, uh, her husband had always filled up her car. This, this woman had, it's a, still a friend of mine, she had never once in her life filled up her car with, her, with gas. 
because her husband always filled her, her car. And, and so uh, years passed, he passed away. And um, after he passed away, she went to the gas pump and stood there totally confused. Didn't know how to do it. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, okay? Knowledge is I know this car needs gas. I know there's gas in that pump. Um, wisdom is I know how to take the nozzle and, and put it in and do all the stuff. And so uh, I, I wasn't the one, but someone had to teach her how to use that. And, and by the way, testament to a good husband. Amen. <laughs> Just taking care of his wife. I think that's wonderful. And so I'm not, I'm not saying that to make fun of her. Um, she never had to fill up her tank. And that's a good thing, I think. Anyway, uh, moving on. Knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is the application of the knowledge. All right, then we have teaching. We already looked at teaching a little bit, but this is uh, similar to that gift of knowledge. But this is the, uh, the ability to not only study, but to communicate um, the, the word of God clearly. Um, there's, I have a friend who he knows more. This guy, he knows more than I would ever know if I lived five lifetimes. Okay, this is just one of those guys. He just absorbs facts. He's just, he was homeschooled, and instead of, like, playing outside, he just, like, read. Who does that? You know, anyway, he's just so smart and brilliant. But I'm telling you, he could try to explain something to me, and I'm going, what? I didn't even understand half of those words, right? And so uh, he's not a teacher, right? But he, he just, he's very smart. He knows so much. Um, the teaching is the ability to take something that's complex, but then break it down to where everyone can understand it. And so uh, the teacher is needed because we need that knowledge uh, to be sort of put through that filter then where we can understand it. And I just listed the Apostle Paul as having that gift of teaching. Then we have exhortation. The gift of exhortation, or we might call it encouragement, is the person who is able to deliver encouragement through, and I, I gave you this verse, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, three types of exhortation. Because exhortation, we say encouragement, we, we think that's always a positive. But exhortation, the scripture is actually two thirds negative. Um, 2 Timothy 4 2, reproving, rebuking, exhorting. Okay? No one likes to be reproved. No one likes to be rebuked. We all love to be exhorted, right? That's the encouraging part. Sometimes, so the exhorter is someone who's not just a cheerleader. Um, the, the gift of mercy person is more of a cheerleader than the gift of exhortation. Okay? The gift of exhortation is someone who is going to encourage you to do good. They're the one that calls you and says, hey, uh, what did you read in your Bible this morning? And you go, duh, 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 you know. They're the ones that's like, hey, uh, you know, I see that you're struggling. How's your prayer life right now? How much have you been praying? That's an exhorter. And, and are those questions a lot of fun? No, not a lot of times, because it just points out. It's like, hey, why, do you gotta talk, why, why can't you go talk to someone else? Like, why do you have to ask me these questions? But the exhorter, they're, they're just wanting to bring you along. They're, 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 they want to encourage you. They're not the prophet. They're not condemning. They're just encouraging. They're, they're pushing you uh, to Christ. And so the, the exhorter is someone who encourages, but it's more of an encouragement to do. Barnabas is our example, right? Barnabas, John Mark had failed. We, we saw this in the book of Acts. He had left uh, during the first missionary journey of Paul. He had gotten, uh, I believe, probably frightened by some of the things that were happening on that journey, and he went home. Second journey comes around, and Barnabas says, hey, let's take John Mark. And uh, Paul says, no way, we're not taking John Mark. He bailed on us last time. Well, guess what? Paul's a, a prophet. It's black or white. It's pass or fail, and John already failed, right? Barnabas is the encourager. He says, no, I'm taking him along. Well, the Bible says the contention was so sharp between them that they went asunder, right? Paul went this way. Barnabas went that way. Barnabas took John Mark with him. He, he encouraged him, to, hey, let's go. Let's go again. Well, I don't know. I don't know, Barnabas. It was pretty rough last time. You're going to be fine. Let's go. We're gonna, you're going to go with me. I'll be there with you. Next thing you know, we have John Mark, uh, or actually Paul asking for John Mark because Paul says he's profitable for me, for the ministry. So Paul, uh, Barnabas was able to bring him along. He was exercising his gift of encouragement. Then we have leadership, number six. I got to move. Leadership is uh, the gift, of, uh, ability to plan, organize, administer, promote projects. They're big picture people. Um, a lot of times they see church in terms of projects. They see a need and they're able to sort of delegate. They're able to organize and function so that uh, things happen. Uh, very good to have an organized church. And so the gift of the leader. Uh, Joseph is was a leader in the scriptures among many others. Um, but you can see Joseph's leadership capabilities 
when he is saving the whole world from the famine. If you remember, uh, he's, he's uh, telling them to store up grain for seven years. They store it all up. And then in the seven bad years, he, he systematically deals the grain back out to them. You, have you ever read that? And, and then he sells, when, when they can't buy the grain back, he, he uh, uh, takes some of their land and property for the grain. And then, but, he, but he works the whole thing out where everyone survives this famine. And so he was one of those with the gift of ruling or leadership. Number seven is the gift of ministry or helps. Um, this is a practical assistance gift. This is the Martha, uh, right? Luke chapter 10, 38 through 42 is Martha. She's, you know, Jesus is there. He's teaching. She's the one in the kitchen getting dinner ready. She's the one baking the bread and washing the plates and putting out the place settings and very irritated that Mary is over there just listening to Jesus when Mary ought to be up working, right? That's the gift of uh, the ministry. And by the way, um, we, we're pretty hard on Martha, and it does say there that Mary had chosen the better part. So in that case, probably would have been better for Martha to come over and just sit and listen to Jesus. But it reveals her gift that she was concerned about the things that need to be done. And, and, and the people with the gift of helps, they, they understand worshiping. They understand uh, uh, having a church service. They understand sitting. But I'm, I'm telling you, sometimes it's hard to get them to stay in here and listen to the preaching. Because they'll tell you this. They'll say, well, there's a lot of stuff around here that needs to be done. And guess what? They're right. There is a lot of stuff that needs to be done. And we're glad that there's the gift of helps and they, they do those things, that gift of serving or ministry. Okay, so um, there's also, you know, people that don't have the gift of helps and, and they seem to think that everything in the church just sort of happens, right? They just walk in, enjoy, walk out, and they think, wow, that's nice. Um, it's, it's like at home that, you know, you just put trash in the trash thing and next time you come back, it's gone. And you're like, how did this happen? Some of you need to. All right, let's keep going. Then we have the gift of giving. All right, gift of giving is someone not, we're all required to give, but the giver is someone who gives a large uh, sum uh, proportionally. They're, they're willing, they want to see the advancement of God's work, and so they're willing to maybe live at a lower level so they can give more. They're willing to maybe work overtime so they can give more. They're willing to take part of their, their Christmas bonus or whatever and give it to the Lord. Uh, when VBS comes, they're the one like pulling up the truckload of pennies to, to help, uh, you know, the offering for VBS. The, these givers that, that are in our church, and we're thankful for them, the gift of the giver I listed as uh, the, the whole church in, in Jerusalem, Acts chapter number two, and then obviously uh, Barnabas was one as well. Uh, then the gift of mercy. Gift of mercy is uh, the one who feels, uh, is able to feel empathetic for hurting people. Um, they minister to those who've been sick and afflicted. So someone with the gift of mercy uh, is one that, that enjoys going and finding those that are downtrodden or maybe those that are sick or afflicted, those maybe that are in the hospital, uh, just had a surgery, uh, those maybe who just lost a loved one. Uh, they, they go and they find them and they love. Their, their, their calling is to go and, and minister to them, to encourage them, uh, sometimes not even through words. They're, they're not necessarily uh, in the, uh, the exhorter. They're not there to really say anything. They're just there. They're just there to minister. They're just there to help and to lend a comfort. The Good Samaritan is a great example of this as he um, not only did he uh, look, seek out the, this one that had been robbed, but he um, empathized and then he helped him uh, regain. And so the gift of mercy. Then we have the gift of faith, the special ability to lay claim on the promises of God in overwhelming circumstances or um, human responsibility. And so those that just, they just trust God for big things uh, over and over and over. And I mentioned the centurion had great faith. And then lastly, the gift of discernment. And we saw this as just an ability to, and again, we all have to be discerning, but there are some that just have a special ability uh, to, to point out and call out false teaching and false doctrine. I gave you Peter uh, having that ability, Acts 5, when he pointed out Ananias and Sapphira's sin. All right, so I'm going to pass these out because we do need to, I, I was trying to go fast and it just didn't happen. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm actually, because we have choir practice, choir, we need to meet downstairs uh, right after this lesson. So what I'll do, I'll pray and then I'm going to leave these, um, I'll leave them right here. So come get you a spiritual gifts test and you can take that now or later. It's a little bit longer one, um, but it'll be fun. Just my, here's my thing, answer truthfully, okay? If it says, I love to give lots of money to the Lord, 
Don't be like, yes, that's what I want to be. If, if it's not you, just put it's not you. Just be honest, because you, you want an honest answer. And on, on, on about half the questions, you'll probably feel guilty, because it's not you. But that's all of us, okay? There's, we're not all gifted with all the gifts. Um, the only way you can really fail this is if you get like 100 on all counts, because then you're just, there's a pride issue, I think. But anyway, uh, so be honest about this. Um, there's a little more stuff there that you can read about how the gifts can be um, maybe categorized or something like that. Uh, but I'll let you read that. So let me pray. We'll uh, pass these out. Lord, thank you for the, how you've gifted your church. I pray that we would not only understand the gifts, but, but that we would uh, find ours and use them. And so, Lord, bless us now, bless in our services to follow. We thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so come grab your spiritual gifts and choir, or your test and choir. We will all now quickly, quickly go downstairs and rehearse our song. The choir books are already down by the piano. Yep, we are ready. <laughs>